What is happiness, and how does it relate to ethics? When we think about virtue, how do we acquire virtue? What is virtue? Let's ask Thomas Aquinas. Let's talk about Thomas Aquinas on happiness and virtue. First, we'll lay the foundation in his discussion on happiness. This is sort of meta-ethics uh, as he lays the foundation for his more specific discussion on virtue. This is taken from the Summa Theologica, which is a major work by Aquinas, probably his most well-known, which is a uh, systematic outlining of many different areas of philosophy. And it takes a question-answer kind of format. So he asks a question that was maybe common to his day, and often he gives objections. Uh, and then he answers these objections, and he gives an answer to the question. So here's just some excerpts. Uh, we'll go over them question by question. First, he asks whether it belongs to a man to act for an end. Yes, but what is an end? Aquinas is influenced by Aristotle, who discovered the four types of causation. These form the complete way to analyze an object of inquiry. For example, a bronze statue, which is just easy because it's a physical object, but you can also analyze action, something a little more abstract, uh, or even human nature or choice, things like this. So first, we have the material cause, where we ask, what is it made of? Uh, Aristotle, these are taken from Aristotle and um, uh, adapted from, or adopted uh, from Aristotle. So Aristotle says, uh, this is that out of which a thing comes to be and which persists. All right, for example, for a bronze statue, Bronze, the material bronze. The formal cause asks, what is it? Or the form or the original pattern. The account of what it is to be such and such. This is the essential attributes of something, not the accidental attributes. So, um, for example, this bronze statue will be sturdy. And the sh it needs to be in the shape of a person or a figure in order for it to be a statue. So these are essential attributes. If it's not sturdy, uh, then it won't be a statue. It'll be something else, right? Um, if it is not the shape of a person or a figure, if it's just sort of straight lines, then it's not going to be a statue. It's just going to be a pillar. So essential attributes are things that must be the case for the identity of the object to stay the same. If an essential attribute changes, then the object changes from something else to something else. So from a bond statue into a pillar. However, um, accidental attributes are things that can change and they don't affect the nature of the thing. So the bronze statue may be of a man or a woman. It may be painted or not painted. These are accidental properties. And what color is it? Uh, what size is it? These kinds of things. We have the efficient cause. What and how uh, created, moved, or maintains it. So this is the primary source of something's changing or remaining as it is. For example, for example the sculptor, the, the artist, is what created this statue. Or the chisel. Uh, was part of the efficient cause that ch that caused the statue to come into being. Also, the act of chiseling. That action is an efficient cause of the existence of the bronze statue. Um, also, just the stability of the bronze material is an efficient cause of its maintaining its shape. The final cause, then, is the most important, and it determines all of the rest. What is its purpose? the end or that for the sake of which something is done, including the tendencies natural to things. So this is to say, um, why? What's my purpose? Well, my purpose is, let's say, uh, to decorate a house, right? To decorate a house um, and to create some sort of decoration that is a memento of some person, right? That's my purpose. So that's immediately going to uh, 
um, uh, I'm going to start asking these other questions. Well, what is it? Well, I want to make a statue. Well, if, I want, if it's going to be a statue, what does it need to be made of? It can't be made of jello. It can be made of something like bronze. And then once I know that, once I know its, its shape and what it is and what material it's going to be, now I can ask, okay, well, how am I going to make this thing? I can uh, hire a sculptor to make it for me. All right, so the final cause is the one that we want to focus on here, purpose or the end, okay, as we're talking about human action. The end is the final cause, also uh, known as telos. Telos means final cause or perfection or completion or, or the attainment of some goal. Think of human nature as a functional concept. For example, a mailman. To be a good mailman, you have to do certain things. If you don't, you're bad at being a mailman. So you have to actually successfully deliver mail. If you don't deliver mail, if you throw it you know, on the street or... If you don't go on your route, you deliver it to the wrong places, you're bad at being a mailman, right? In fact, you could be so bad at being a mailman that it's not very serious for someone to really even call you a mailman or a mailwoman. Um, to be so similar, a similar concept is human nature as this functional kind of concept. To be morally good at being human, you have to do certain things, right? Certain kinds of things are counted as moral, and other things are immoral. Good refers to a certain standard, an explanation of what a good human or mailman does. Right? Just the word good, not even moral goodness, but just the word good refers to a standard. This is what we're aiming at. Right? So we have better and worse. We have a varying degrees of success at expressing this good, whether that good is mailman or human nature. When it's human nature, then the good becomes a reference to morality. What does a good human actually look like? Whatever the answer, that is the end or goal or final cause of human nature. All right? Like a car, human nature is designed to function in a certain way. If you don't follow that way, then it will break and be bad. So if you put the wrong kind of fuel in the car, or uh, you don't get an oil change, or you don't care for the car in the right ways, uh, then it will break and it will be bad. Right? It is designed to function in a certain way. So human nature is designed to function in a certain way. And whatever that way is, that is called the end or the goal, or the final cause. That sort of perfect functioning car, or perfect functioning mailman, or perfect functioning human. This is the end, or the goal, the final cause of human nature. All human action is thus for the purpose of some end or goal that explains what humans are attempting to achieve or accomplish with every choice. The ultimate end uh, is just another word for that final goal. Ultimate end final goal. Same thing. We also have proximate goals. Proximate goals are goals sought as steps toward the ultimate goal. So for example, uh, you may be taking a class and that is a goal that you successfully complete a class, a certain class uh, at a school, but that's a proximate end because that, you, the reason that you're taking a class is so that you can finish the class and so that you can finish many classes and obtain a degree and then even that your education is for the purpose of another goal uh, namely to get a job but even getting a job is for the purpose of another goal um, and eventually you know which is to gain money and that is for uh, feeding yourself and your family and uh, acquiring other pleasures, right? But even those, those are for the sake of something. So everything we do is ultimately directed toward the next step. But what is the ultimate end? What is the last and final goal? For example, I choose to go to school, to graduate, which is approximate, which in turn is to get a job, which in turn is to be happy. Happiness is the ultimate goal uh, that we are after with all of these different things to do. In the most generic 
understanding of what that end goal is, it is happiness. There can be only one ultimate end by definition. Uh, this refers to the idea of commensurate goods, which is to say that all goods, all proximate goods, every different kind of good, being a mailman uh, or finishing this class or uh, getting an education, all these goals, goals we seek to obtain, ultimately point to one final cause that fulfills all previous choices. All goods are extrinsically valuable until the final cause, which is intrinsically valuable. So when something has extrinsic value, that means it is valuable insofar as it is an instrument or tool for getting you something else. And if it does not get you something else, then it is not even valuable. That is extrinsically valuable. Something that has intrinsic value is something that is valuable for its own sake. You want this thing just because it is valuable, not because it is useful in getting you something else. So commensurate goods is going to say that there is one ultimate end. Everything we do is for that ultimate end. A competing idea is that goods are incommensurate which is to say there are a plurality of intrinsic goods that are sought for their own sake. Human choices do not ultimately aim at one common final cause. People may choose different ultimate goals. Aquinas says that, Aquinas says that goods must be commensurate because every choice is for a purpose, and choosing between two mutually exclusive goods requires an ultimate end beyond them that directs the choice. So we can't have two equal and opposite ultimate ends because when there are multiple options how do you know why, why would you pick one rather than the other why would you pick a rather than b well whatever your reason is that is the ultimate end if you have any reason then that reason is the ultimate end and of course in every choice, we have a reason, even if we're not always aware of the reason. So let's continue with this question. Whether it belongs to a man to act for an end. Let's think about a choice. A choice, we can analyze with the four causes. A material cause of a choice is that it's an action of the intellectual power. Right? It's an action of the mind. Uh, my mind shows. It's an action. The formal cause are the attributes of the object that is chosen. So. I choose, uh, let's say, to eat an apple rather than a cake. All right. So the attributes of the object are that it's a fruit, for example. Um, that is part of the formal cause. That is the object of choice, this fruit. The efficient cause is of the action. The thing that gives rise to the action, the thing that causes the action, is the free will of human nature, my will, my capacity to choose, uh, is the efficient cause. Now Aquinas says, now man differs from irrational, this is Aquinas, uh, now man differs from irrational animals in this, that he is master of his actions through his reason and will. Whence, too, the free will is defined as the faculty and will of reason. Therefore, those actions are properly called human, which proceed from a deliberate will. And if any other actions are found in man, they can be called actions of a man, but not properly human actions, since they are not proper to man as man. So people can do many different kinds of things, uh, for example, eating or um, flinching when somebody... Uh, hits you, something like this. But those are not uniquely human actions. But expressing your free will in choice in accordance with reason, this is a, a uniquely human kind of action. That's all he's trying to say here, that free will is an essential attribute of human nature. And then final cause of a choice is to obtain the object that is chosen. That's my purpose. That's my goal, is I want to obtain this apple or whatever it is I have chosen. So all of that, in conclusion, is to say that mankind does indeed act for an end. 
But let's move on and uh, see what the next question is. Whether any created good constitute man's happiness. So a created good is just something in uh, the physical world, something on earth, so to speak. Whether any created good constitutes man's happiness. What is it that we seek in happiness? What is happiness? Um, just as a side note, this word happiness comes from eudaimonia in Greek, which is, you, you see the word eu right there, eu, like euphoria or utopia, um, that means good, and daimonia, daimon, that's a spirit or uh, a presence, a persona, um, or a life. So this is to say a good life. What is happiness? Happiness is a good life. But we're jumping ahead of ourselves. Let's see how this pans out. Whether any created good constitutes man's happiness. No, Aquinas says. But first we must understand more about human nature to see why that is the answer. Human reason seeks more than just truth about individual particulars. So I have four different apples in front of me, and they're slightly different. They may even be, be the same kind of apple. Slightly different size, slightly different shape. But from them, as I see these different particulars, I then have one idea of apple in my mind. I learn from seeing these multiple particulars, individual particulars, I learn from seeing many of them what the idea of apple is in my mind. All right, so now I have something in my mind which is in common with all of these things, which is apple, whatever the definition of apple is. But your mind seeks universal or higher truths, like anything animals don't know. So I don't just want to know what an apple is. I want to know what beauty is. I want to know what health is, and not just physical health, but mental health, and if there's such a thing, spiritual health, and all kinds of health. What is it to be a good human, right? M morality, right? We want to think about these higher universal truths, and up and up we go. Even, even uh, what is in common between truth and beauty? and health, all these different things, we go up and up, what is the most universal and common idea, like the good, right? Goodness, what is goodness? We wanna know, We the mind naturally seeks these higher understandings, right? Since a person is an individual, and this individual seeks universal knowledge, the individual seeks something beyond itself, right? So this idea of goodness that I seek, that's something that I can't find just in myself because I am only one. And I want to I know goodness as a universal. I want to know goodness in itself. I want to know truth in itself. I want to know them as universals. Um, in fact, I cannot even fully understand it in one particular self unless I also understand the universal. To some degree, the intellect seeks truth that is universal and beyond oneself. This is Aquinas' reasoning. The will seeks good that is universal or common to all people. Right, not just what is useful to me, but what is morally good for all humans. We seek the good, which is the ultimately meaningful life of human flourishing that fulfills our abilities. And longings. Our desire for the universal cannot be fulfilled in obtaining one particular thing. So it's not enough that I just know about this one apple. That's not what my mind seeks. My mind seeks to know about many apples, to know about fruit, to know about plants, to know about life, to know about what is good life? Up and up we go. We desire to know the universal things, and it cannot be fulfilled in just knowing one particular thing or several particular things. It can only be fulfilled in obtaining the universal good. 
What is this higher good thing that is universal and higher than any created particular? What is this thing? Well, Aquinas is going to say it is God. God is goodness itself as an abstract kind of thing. God is both abstract and concrete. But right now we're thinking a lot, largely in terms of his abstract nature of just being goodness itself. If goodness were a person, that would be God. Every creature has goodness by participation. That is to say, uh, the when when I am, let's say, patient, and when you are patient, we both have patience in us, but patience itself is something different than either of us, something uh, separate from us. And we both participate in patience or humility or honesty, whatever. All right, and that separate thing, that separate thing which is patience or humility or all of these things together, which is goodness, is uh, God, that separate thing. Therefore, only God can fulfill and satisfy the human desire for that which is good. So if only those that understanding of those universals, particularly of goodness, if only knowledge of goodness satisfies human desire, and if goodness is God, then only God satisfies, uh, fully satisfies human desire. And that is what constitutes man's happiness, in answer to this question at the top. Aquinas agrees with Aristotle that human nature is teleological, or ordered towards an end, and fulfilled in obtaining happiness, right? This is just in agreement with Aristotle. This happiness is not a mere quantity of pleasure, but is the flourishing life that is meaningful and fulfills all that it is to be human. But happiness is general. What specifically constitutes that happiness? How do we get it? Aquinas makes this general answer specific by saying that humans find happiness in God. So happiness is the generic generic or general answer to what is the chief end of man but the specific answer is god because happiness is specifically found in god i encourage you to watch my uh, videos on aristotle uh, to gain a little bit more background on this these ideas so here's another way of saying it. c.s lewis says He's the uh, author of the Chronicles of Narnia. If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. We all seek happiness. We all seek it in all kinds of things. All right? We might seek it in loving relationships. We might seek it in money and acquiring possessions. You might seek it in something else, like sports, maybe extreme sports, or watching sports, participating in sports, some kind of fun activity. We might seek it in power. We might seek it in achieving some goal, um, whether that is you know, getting a gold medal at the Olympics, or uh, getting a su successful career, or something like this that, is, that we think is self-fulfillment. Or we might try to seek it in... Uh, family life, something like this. We seek happiness in all of these things. But we never fully, fully satisfy our longings. Right? All of these never quite satisfy our longings. In each of these kinds of situations, we will still long for more. More of the same or more of something else. It will never quite perfectly satisfy our longings. We want something more. Augustine said uh, about God in a prayer to God, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Even in loving relationships, right? Uh, we never attain that perfectly loving relationship. And even so, even, even if we were somehow hypothetically to gain a perfectly loving family life, let's say, even that does not quite satisfy our longings. There's something more 
that we want because we know that that is temporary. It's fleeting, right? Uh, children grow up and move out, and then the family changes, right? People die. Something is not satisfied still, not in a permanent way and not perfectly. Fulfillment comes in nothing less than union with God, according to Aquinas. Now he asks whether man's happiness consists in the division, the vision of the divine essence, right? That means beholding or understanding, uh, truly understanding God's essence. That's what it is asking. Of course, he's going to say yes. The vision of the divine essence uh, is also called the beatific vision. Beatific just means blessed. So, blessed vision uh, or union, state of perfect happiness achieved in union with God. That's what this idea of beatific vision is in Aquinas. Man is not, he says, perfectly happy so long as something remains for him to desire and seek. Perfect happiness is found in the full knowledge of God's essence that is humanly possible in terms of our being finite creatures, right? We want perfect knowledge of God's essence. That constitutes perfect happiness. Because I think also knowledge here refers to union with uh, this goodness. So we want to be good. We want to have uh, moral goodness in ourselves. So this is what constitutes happiness. The essence of God is that he is the good. So obtaining union with him is to become perfect and receive maximal fulfillment of all desire. Human nature seeks truth and goodness. And those are found in the essence of God. Think about one of the most important things that we desire. We desire to be good and to love being good. And we will, we will be good. We will obtain that in union with God if we uh, obtain the beatific vision. So what does this mean? This is the fulfillment of all human ability. Any ability or desire that humans have is fulfilled in this relationship with God. It means the perfection of all virtue. Uh, God is the perfection of all virtue, and we will obtain the perfection of all virtue in union with him. So wisdom, we will be perfectly wise, have perfect self-control, courage, justice, faith, hope, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, all of these different things, these virtues, uh, are fully fulfilled in union with God. Can you imagine what being perfect would be like? That would be union with God. Now he asks whether one can be happy in this life. Can you actually obtain happiness in this life? He says, a certain participation of happiness, or human flourishing, can be had in this life, but perfect and true happiness cannot be had in this life. This may be seen from a twofold consideration. First, happiness excludes all evils. Since we cannot obtain perfection in this life and be free from internal and external evils, we can only have happiness in part. Second, happiness is the beatific vision, or union with God. We cannot gain the beatific vision until life after death. Now he asks whether man can attain happiness by his natural powers, on his own ability, all by himself. He says no. Happiness is specifically fulfilled in the beatific vision. Since the blessed vision or union with God is beyond the capacity of the intellect, it is impossible to obtain on human effort alone, right? So we are seeking the universal, but we are a particular. That is beyond human ability. We are seeking the infinite, union with the infinite, but we are finite. Therefore, man cannot obtain happiness on his own effort. He asks whether man attains happiness through the action of some higher creature, right? If we can't do it on our own, maybe we get it from something else. Yes, of course the answer is. Because happiness is something more than human power can obtain by itself, it must come as a gift from above, from God. When God gives happiness, he expresses love by fulfilling someone's human nature. He fulfills their nature by giving them himself, since human nature is fulfilled only in knowledge of God. Remember, God is the good and the true. Human natures seek goodness and truth to fulfill itself. 
uh, those are ultimately found in God, for all truth and goodness are derived from this character, from his essence. Right? Truth itself, goodness itself, as constituted in a universal uh, that is itself a being. Because God is the infinite, no finite creature can grasp the stars, so to speak. So God comes to us. Now he asks whether every man desires happiness. Is this actually everybody's desire? Yes, he says. But happiness is considered in two ways. One is general happiness. Everyone desires happiness. Happiness is the fulfillment of desire, just by definition. If you want something, the satisfaction of that want is happiness. And of course, every action is characterized by want. Every person is characterized by want. So everybody desires happiness. We seek perfect satisfaction. And then also specific happiness. Though all people seek happiness, not everyone knows the right place to find it. The only thing that fully satisfies is union with God, right? We might try to find it in those other things, in power or money, family or relationships, but they're not going to be, uh, happiness is not going to be fully satisfied unless we have union with God, according to Aquinas. People may seek happiness, but not seek God, who is the specific fulfillment of happiness. Right? They may seek something else, trying to find happiness. Someone may seek happiness in things other than God, but they will never find perfect satisfaction. Now, he asks whether the circumstances are properly set forth in the third book of ethics. You don't need to know about the third book of ethics, but this is shifting gears a little bit into... Uh, an analysis of of actions and circumstances. What is circumstance when we talk about action? We've been discussing the nature of ethics so far as a meta-ethical inquiry in talking about happiness. Now we begin to discuss some principles that will guide application. Right as we get into uh, some more some more specific principles about ethics. When we seek to apply a general moral principle like courage, we must ask ourselves how it should be expressed in my particular circumstances today. So it's, it's true that you should be courageous, I should be courageous, uh, other people should be courageous and patient and humble, these kinds of things. But what does courage look like for me today, right now? All right, that's going to look different than what it looks like for you today, right now. I may understand that something is good considered in itself, like stopping a bank robbery. But how do I understand whether I should do this action in my particular situation? All things considered, right? Considered in itself, stopping a bank robbery is a good thing. Uh, but am I the right person for that? I mean, certainly it would be good for a police person, policeman to do that. But am I the right person to do that? In order to answer this, we need to look at the seven circumstances or variables that affect the situation, right? So we analyze these seven different circumstantial variables in order to determine whether an action is good, right? This is not uh, talking about general moral principles, right? Because we, we might say the general moral principle of courage is considered in itself good. What we're asking now is, uh, I have before me a particular choice between uh, doing this or doing that, between um, going back to school and getting an education for a job or getting this other job that is offered to me, right? I can go back to school or take the job, right? So how do I know uh, what I should do? How do I know what is good, what is morally best? Well. I would need to look at all the different circumstantial variables uh, because education considered itself is good and also having a job is considered itself good. Let's look at an example. Here's the situation. I'm in a bank and a robbery begins. What should I do? Should I attack, call the cops, or something else? Let's consider the circumstantial variables. Who? Am I the right person for the job? Am I doing this to the right person? Right? Um, so maybe the police should do it instead. 
Maybe I'm in a wheelchair and I'm the wrong person for it, and I don't have a very good probability of success. I'll probably cause more harm than good. Or perhaps I am uh, a very healthy and strong person, and other people around me are not as healthy and strong. I don't have any children with me, and there are families around me. Maybe I'm the right person to do this. Right? Who? What about what? Is the action I'm considering a morally good action in and of itself? Right? Am I going to torture this guy or uh, have an excess of violence? Well, maybe I'm just going to tackle him. Right? That seems uh, rather morally neutral. So, is what I'm doing itself um, is it evil or is it good or is it uh, neutral? Right? And if it's neutral, then the rest of the circumstances are going to determine how I am using this neutral thing for good or evil. Also, by what aids or instruments am I, am I using something evil? So, uh, let's say I have a knife and he's got a gun. And uh, for the sake of uh, self-preservation, for protecting my own life in self-defense or uh, defending... Uh, People who are behind me, I might use a knife or a gun, right? Uh, this seems to be using something morally neutral for uh, a good purpose. However, what about perhaps there are instruments that are evil in themselves, um, right? There's all kinds of debate about whether or not a nuclear bomb is evil in and of itself, right? That depends on uh, your view of that and perhaps circumstance as well. But what about... Uh, we have heard in history in times past where one group of people would take an infant who has a disease, wrap them in a blanket, and give them to the enemy in order to spread disease in the enemy, sort of uh, biological warfare. And it's using an infant, a child. Of course, children are used in warfare today as well. Is that an, is that an evil instrument to use? Right, children in warfare, um, let's say. All right, so what's the instrument? Also, why? This is the most important. What's my goal? What's my motive? Do I have a noble intention? Am I going to tackle this judge, this guy, just because I love violence? Maybe I hate this guy, just like maybe I know him, and so I just want to seek revenge. Right? Revenge is not a noble intention in this situation, but the preservation of life, my own life, and other people's life, uh, the preservation of peace, and uh, the preservation of justice are good intentions, right? So what's the intention? This is the most important one because you can do something good for a bad purpose and you're still a bad person, right? So in terms of whether or not uh, a person is moral, this is the most important one. Why? And then how? Right, to the end, justify the means. Am I doing something bad with good intention? Right, so I'm just going to tackle him, and I'm doing it for good intention. That's no problem, right? Um, but I probably shouldn't torture him, or I probably shouldn't um, use excessive violence, uh, if that makes sense. So, how? Right, there are certain situations where um, we need to give up accomplishing some good objective because the only means available to us are a bad means. So let's say um, superhero movies are pretty popular right now. So let's think about vigilante justice. All right. Or is, is Batman uh, justified in seeking justice on his own? And in his activities, um, you know, not condoned uh, by the government. Um, so he is an agent of self rather than an agent of government. So uh, when he tries to do things, if we even grant that vigilante justice is permissible, while he does things, um, is it permissible for him to torture one, uh, let's say, gangster for the sake of obtaining information that will lead to the downfall of a whole crime syndicate in the city? Or is that not a justified means, right? It would certainly aid in a lot of good happening, but is torture permissible in that situation, 
right? Maybe other situations it might be, or maybe it's never permissible. Um, how? That's important. Do the ends justify the means? Right? How utilitarian or consequentialist are we going to be or not? And then when? Right? Uh, is it the right time for me to jump on this uh, bank robber? Right? Maybe if I do it too soon, um, then I won't be able to stop the other bank robbers. Or maybe if I try too soon, then I'll just fail and uh, I won't be able to catch him while he's not looking. Right? And I might just end up uh, ha causing harm to myself and to others if I do too soon. Or if I do too late, then I might miss my chance. Right? When? What's the right timing for this? Where? What's the right place, right? So if uh, if I am standing in the lobby and there's lots of other people around, there's a high risk that many people will be injured if I do it here. However, uh, if I am, let's say, the bank teller and I am taking the bank robber into a private back room uh, like a vault, now here there's lower risk of um, collateral damage of other people being harmed. So maybe this is a better location to do it, right? I think about these things. I strategize. If I'm even the right person to do it, right? Maybe I'm a policeman and I'm trying to figure out the right uh, place to attack this bank robber, right? Where? Now Aquinas asks whether the most important circumstances are why and in what act uh, and in what the act consists, right? There are two of the circumstantial variables. Why is the purpose or goal the final cause or intention of the action, my motive? Uh, this is the most important aspect for moral responsibility. Does a person have a good motive, we ask? One may do something good with a bad motive, and it is not meritorious. It's not praiseworthy, right? You may do something good um, for a bad reason. We can all think of easy examples for that, right? Uh, is motive enough to make something good or not? Well, no, because you can have even a good motive and do the wrong thing, right? The f this is the f what, the form of the action that is done. You have a good motive and you do the wrong thing. There's a common saying that says, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? We can have good intentions and still do the wrong thing. Because in, intention or motive is not the only variable. It is the most important one, um, but it is not the only variable that makes something good or bad. What action does the person perform? One may do something bad with good motives and still be at fault. Let's give a summary about circumstance. Every moral choice contains a why, which is the most important circumstantial variable for determining one's responsibility. The other circumstantial variables should be assessed as well to determine, all things considered, whether the choice was a moral one. Sometimes, not all of the other variables are important. It depends on the situation. Let me make an additional comment about this all things considered. Uh, that is an important concept because it is in contrast to something considered in itself. So courage is good considered in itself. But all things considered, what is it that I should do? All things are all of the circumstantial things, right? So the general moral principle may be good, uh, and in this particular situation, I need to assess all of the circumstantial variables in order to determine how to act out the general moral principle. How do I act in courage in this particular bank robbery? Right? Courage could say that instead of jumping on the bad guy, I should call the police, right? Aquinas also asks whether a human action is good or evil from its end, or whether man's action is good or evil from circumstances. So uh, what determines that an action is good or evil? Is it uh, the end, the why, or from circumstance? Aquinas says that a choice has essential qualities and accidental or unnecessary uh, qualities about the thing. Let's say I chose to go to work. Well, the essential attributes are uh, that I get to work, right? Accidental qualities might be 
the particular route that I take. Do I take surface streets or the freeway? Or do I get in a car accident? Because that is outside of the essence of my choice. I didn't choose to get in a car accident. That's why it's called a car accident. But I see my video on Aristotle's four causes and also on his ethics to get some more background on some of this. A choice gains its moral merit from four sources, actually. The genus, or what kind of action is it, right? This is asking about the what. When we have the seven circumstantial variables, uh, the second most important one is what. And when we ask what action this is, first we ask what kind of action is this? Is this an overly violent action or as a generous action? What kind of action is this? And then uh, in, in the genus, genus means uh, generic or general uh, category, right? But in the specific, the species, the specific choice that I'm making right now, not just what kind of action is this, but what specific action is this? What specific object is chosen? Right? That could be evil or it could be good. And then, of course, all of the other circumstantial variables. What circumstantial variables contribute to judgment, uh, whether the choice is right or wrong, all things considered, right? All these other circumstantial variables affect whether something is uh, right or wrong. And then, of course, the most important circumstantial variable is the why or the end, the purpose, final cause, motive, or goal. This is the most important source of an action's merit. Right, everything else could be wrong, and this could be right, and they have a little bit of moral merit. Right, if all of the other circumstantial variables are right, but the why is wrong, I have a bad motive, and I'm doing the right thing in the right circumstances in the right way, then it's still not morally good. It may produce good consequences for other people, but I am not moral if I do not have a good motive. Let's do an example, uh, assessing it with these circumstantial variables. Let's talk about euthanasia. That's a, a big area of contention in American ethics. First, we ask who, right? Uh, so we might ask about the patient, right? Their nature. Um, what's their status, right? Euthanasia is the taking of the life of a medical patient, um, but the patient may be in a coma or not in a coma. Usually uh, it is done for the purpose of uh, relieving them of pain, something like that. We'll talk about why here in a second. But euthanasia is different than doctor-assisted suicide because suicide implies voluntariness, so it involves choice of the patient to die. Uh, but euthanasia is broader than that and includes uh, the taking of the life of someone who is in a coma in a vegetative state. Right? So euthanasia, is it permissible or not? Or not? First, we ask about the who of the person, the patient. Right? What's their status, their medical status? Also, we might ask about the who of the doctor. Does the doctor have the right, the permission from government, or even just the ontological, ethical uh, right uh, to take life, right? Or does the, does the family of this patient have the right to make this choice for them? Even in Dr. Sister's Suicide, does the patient themselves have the right to choose whether or not they live or die, right? Who? Then the instrument. So in this case, uh, in the case of euthanasia, probably this is the n not the most important circumstantial variable because all the instruments are going to be things that are fairly morally neutral, right? Like uh, chemicals injected into somebody's um, into somebody's body. But we don't want to use an instrument that is going to cause them unnecessary pain. Uh, we don't want to use maybe like an axe. We don't want to use some sort of serum that is going to torture them to death and take a long time. We want something that is going to happen quickly. If if euthanasia is permissible, right? Then how, right? How is closely related to instrument, um, right? Is 
is the doctor going to do it uh, over a long period of time that is very costly and uh, very trying on the emotions of family members and perhaps painful to the patient or is it going to be over and done with very quick right uh, how and then when is it the right time to do this perhaps we should wait until this person who's in a coma uh, maybe we'll wait a little bit and see if they wake up right we don't want to make too hasty of a judgment or maybe we want to uh, be sure to do it rather quick because they are in pain in lots of pain right when also where right we don't want to do this in a back alley somewhere we want to do it in uh, the hospital if it's going to be done at all right um, with the proper people present right with in in a location where health can be preserved and diseases are not going to be spread um, in a sanitary kind of environment and of course, the most important one is why, right? Are we justified in doing euthanasia? That is largely going to depend on why. So what are some of the reasons? Well, one is to preserve the quality of life. However, you might want to think, if we're preserving quality of life, how is death preserving life? Whose quality of life is it preserving? It's certainly not preserving the patient's quality of life because they don't have any life left to have quality, right? So anything, any life is more quality of life than death, right? Unless we're talking about quality of death and I don't even know that there is such a thing. What about convenience? Perhaps convenience, right? This is very expensive to keep this person on life support. Um, and so maybe we just don't have enough money left right maybe we need room in the hospital for patients who are uh, who have a better chance of success right something like this consequential sort of consideration of convenience um, or maybe even just comfort right we want closure we don't want to wait 40 years as this person is in a super long coma we want it to be over and done with right um, so are these noble purposes, noble motives, or not, right? Um, and then last is what, right? What is it that we're doing? Euthanasia. Well, that's the main thing that we're investigating. What's the nature of the thing? Well, it's killing. Is killing ever permissible, right? Certainly most people say that killing is permissible in war under some restricted, restricted circumstances. Killing is permissible in self-defense. Is killing permissible in euthanasia, right? Let's look at another example. Abortion, all right? Uh, another big contentious debate in America today and honestly throughout the world. Who, all right? Uh, this is similar to the last one. Who has the right to take life and under what circumstances, right? Um, and is it is this life, right? Who can be the object who is um, receiving the abortion? Is, is this um, fetus, what is it? Who is it, right? Is it even a who yet? That's the major important thing, right? Is a fetus a life or is it not a life? And even if it is a life, is it a person, right? We're talking about personhood. So that is... Uh, Probably one of the most important aspects of this debate is the who, right? Different um, objects of inquiry, different actions uh, assess each of the seven circumstances in different ways. And depending on the thing that we are investigating, um, some of the circumstances, some of the circumstantial variables may be more or less important than others. The instrument, all right? Um, you, so we use a chemical that's going to cause a measurable sensation of pain to the fetus, right? Even if it's not a person, we tend not to want to torture animals because we can see that they have a sensation of pain. Um, it's the same going to be true for a fetus, right? We can measure the pain uh, fetus has right there's a certain stage in development where they can feel pain 
And so do we want to use something that causes pain or use something that does not, right? An instrument um, is the instrument itself uh, evil or morally neutral, something along those lines. Also, how? How do we want to do it? That's similar to instrument. Instrument refers to the pair of scissors or the chemical that is used. How is maybe more about the process. Is it going to uh, be an elongated process or quick? Is it going to cause health problems for the mother or not? Um, how? What is the process? What's the means that we're going to use? When, right? Of course, that's a big area of debate in abortion, you know, whether or not abortion should be permissible uh, before a certain point, right? Late-term abortions, first trimester abortions, right? When when should we, this be the case? Um, when has a great deal of importance on consideration about abortion? And then where, right? Should this be done in a hospital? We, we, we don't want to see... Uh, that people are having abortions in back alleyways, you know, with coat hangers. Um, that was, uh, that has been the case in a widespread way in our country, right? That's not sanitary and can cause all kinds of health problems. Um, where could also be nowhere, depending on the answer to some of the other circumstantial variables. But if it's going to be, if it's going to take place, it is a medical procedure. That's part of the what coming up later, and so probably uh, it is more sanitary to do it in a clean building than a back alleyway, um, but the where by itself says nothing about the morality of the overall action, right? The why. Why is this to be done, all right? Is it a medical emergency where the mother's life is at risk? Um, even in that situation, it's still debated whether or not uh, it's permissible to take the life of the fetus, right? Another purpose might be rape, okay? Rape uh, may make it uh, permissible and maybe not. That's debated um, even among pro-lifers. That's uh, a debate whether or not rape excuses abortion. And then how would you even know if someone's claim that they were raped uh, is legitimate, right? So why? What about um, convenience, right, uh, of the mother and her quality of life, um, whether or not that is uh, viable and what that even means, what quality of life does that even mean? Um, what about the quality of life of the fetus, right? Let's say that a fetus is known to have a genetic deformity, Down syndrome, or um, perhaps a disease, right? There is a country in Europe that is proud of the fact that they have, uh, that they have minimized the Down syndrome population of their country to almost zero, all right? So that uh, they are claiming this uh, as being a success because that means that people are healthier. Um, however, they have done that through um, abortions, aborting uh, babies. There's a mandatory, um, a mandatory test for whether or not a fetus is likely to have Down syndrome, and so uh, most fetuses that have Down syndrome or will develop Down syndrome are aborted. Um, so that is certainly preserving the quality of the life overall in the country in one respect. Um, but another question might be whether or not it's preserving the quality of life for the child, right, uh, or for the fetus. Um, of course, like we talked about with euthanasia, it's not preserving quality of life because death does not preserve quality of life. When we talk about quality of life, we're typically talking about health, and it's not very healthy to die. Um, so that's interesting. What's the motive? What's the motive? Um, and of course, that is largely going to be influenced also by the who, right? What is this thing that's inside of this person? Is it a fetus? Is it a life? Is it a human? Is it a person? What's the moral status of this thing? Then the what? What is it that we're doing? Well, we're doing 
in abortion here, right? Is that is abortion a thing that is intrinsically evil, or is it intrinsically neutral, or is it even intrinsically good, right? What is the thing that we're doing? Now let's talk more specifically about Aquinas on his concepts of virtue, right? This is getting from meta-ethics a little bit more into normative ethics. Uh, the circumstantial variables we just talked about are talking a lot about some principles to help us in applied ethics. Let's talk about normative ethics, his discussion about virtue. He asks whether human virtue is a habit, also whether human virtue is a good habit, also, whether virtue is suitably defined, right? So we're trying to get a definition of virtue. He says virtue denotes a certain perfection of a power. Now, a thing's perfection is considered chiefly in regard to its end. So this is to say that people have abilities. One ability is reason. And the ability to use reason is different than being good at thinking, all right? So everybody has the ability to think, but people have different degrees of how good they are at thinking. Thinking is just just in the speculative kind of sense, right? But it, Or um, choosing, choosing good, right? People have varying degrees of how well they choose, and if they choose good things, if they make good choices, right? But everybody has the power to choose. So virtue, in its most abstract sense, right? This is not even talking about morality yet. In its most abstract sense, virtue is just a perfection of a power, right? Of an ability. Power is just an ability. Humans have many powers or abilities in their human nature, right? For example, the vegetative power which is the power of reproduction, growth, homeostasis, right? This is to say life, right? We share this power with plants and animals. And then there's the sensitive power, which, is, which are the five senses and emotion, all right? Animals have this as well. And there's the intellectual power. Humans only, and this is why we're called the rational animal. If you want to know more specifically about what is meant by these, then look up my video on Aquinas. Um, on uh, free will, where I talk uh, more about his anatomy of mind, his philosophy of mind. Right? Because even within the intellectual power, there's the thinking aspect, the cognitive power, and there's the desiring aspect, the will, uh, the uh, appetitive power, as it's called. Right? Look up that video for more information on that. The intellect, oh, I have it right here. Cognitive power, thinking, and the appetitive power of the will. Right? We have these in virtue of being human, we have free will, and we have the ability to uh, do higher reasoning. People can act in different ways, but only some ways properly express human powers. Still asking the same questions. People can't act in different ways. Uh, or sorry, people can act in different ways, but only some ways properly express human powers. When an act is repeated through effort, it becomes a habit. Right? Each time you act, the next time becomes easier until eventually it's habit. Habit is a disposition to act in a certain way in similar circumstances. Right? Disposition. So it's a character trait. You do something long enough and it just becomes a character trait. Right? So the first time you do it, it takes a lot of thought and effort to make the choice. The second time, it's a little bit easier. Eventually, it's a habit, and it's automatic. It's natural to you. It's part of your personality. It's a disposition to act in a certain way in similar circumstances. That's a habit. Uh, practice makes perfect. That's to say, you do something long enough, and it'll become a habit, right? Habit, uh, habit perfects or fulfills different powers, right? So thinking well or choosing well. Right? It takes practice. And eventually, practice makes perfect. Intellectual virtue, um, th these, are, these are some examples of different kinds of habits. Right? This is not an exhaustive list. There may be other kinds of habits. So intellectual virtue, so cognition, thinking. Somebody's smart because they have good habits of mind. 
right? And moral virtue, will. They're good at choosing the right kinds of things. Emotional habits, right? That's of the sensitive power. So uh, when that song comes on the radio, you just have an emotional response. Or when you see somebody in need, you uh, immediately have a sense of sympathy, right? You have these emotional habits that are triggered by smells and sights and sounds and situations where you just automatically have these reactions, emotional habits. And you can guide these habits. You can change these habits through choices. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of time. Practice makes perfect. Physical habits as well, right? We talk about muscle memory. We talk about maybe uh, a football player who has all this muscle memory. And in the situation, he doesn't have to think. He just reacts. And he does so in such a perfect way in a, at a uh, professional level that he uh, just expresses these good physical habits, right? Muscle men memory. Virtue is a disposition to act in a certain way where the disposition is a distinctly human excellence uh, that fulfills or perfects a power, right? So this is not just talking about muscle memory. This is primarily talking about cognition or will. Therefore, virtues are good because they are a proper expression of human nature, rational animal, all right? Um, they are expressions of what it is to be human. We also want to know this Greek word telos, which means end or a proper function of a human. Telos means end, right? That's what we're after, the proper functioning of a human. Right? And that is constituted in happiness. We talked about human flourishing, fully expressed in, which is fully expressing human nature perfectly. But how is human nature expressed perfectly? Well, through the virtues. So the virtues constitute the happy life. Living virtuously is living happily or flourishing. Human may be understood as a functional concept. We already went over this briefly uh, earlier in this video, but just to recap, right? for example, a good mailman is one who delivers mail and doesn't go to lunch, let's say. All right, uh, He does not fail to deliver mail, sleep instead, or deliver to the wrong place. Right? A good car transports people with little hassle, not a car that has engine problems or a flat tire or is unsafe. So something that functions well according to its nature. What's the proper function of a human? Well, what is a human? A human's proper function is based on human nature. Right? We mentioned this earlier. Uh, humans are defined as rational animal. That is human nature. Therefore, the proper function of humanity is to live a rational character. Rational character not only knows virtue, Plato talked about the contemplation of virtue as being sufficient, but also has virtue, lives it out. It's a habit. That's from Aristotle. Someone who is good at being human lives virtuously, which is to say living rationally. That means your choices are uh, characterized by a habit, a disposition of having a pattern, like a pattern of being humble. Um, and that pattern has been developed through practice to make a habit, right? So that initially you have difficult. Uh, choices that take a lot of thought and consideration, and each time you make the choice, if you choose the right thing, gradually it develops into a habit that we might call, oh, that person has a good character, a good, that person is humble, that person is patient, that person is really generous, right? It turns into a character trait through practice, and that, those character traits, the collection of those character traits are what constitutes human flourishing, right? And those character traits came from practice. They are habits, and they came from practice. And practice comes from individual actions and choices that are chosen in accordance with reason and not just uh, foolish uh, reactions without thinking. Um, emotional responses that uh, are not guided by wisdom. All right, that's not just that's not the same. All right, a good person does not react based on irrational emotion or lack of self control or lack lack of self examination. Aquinas also asks whether there are only three habits of the speculative intellect: wisdom, science, and understanding. 
and whether virtue is adequately divided into moral and intellectual virtue. This is getting into kinds of virtue. All right? Uh, I encourage you to watch my video, Aquinas, on will and free will. Uh, you'll see this image as sort of a mental map. If you have already watched that, then this is just a reminder. And some of this will make a little bit more sense with that background. So we have the intellectual power, right? So there's the vegetative power, the sensitive power, and the intellectual power, right? Vegetative is plants. Uh, the sensitive power is animals. And the intellectual power is humans. Of course, humans have all three. Intellectual power sets us apart. What is the intellectual power? Well, the intellectual power is thinking and choosing. The cognitive power and the intellectual appetitive power, desire, right? Um, so these two different powers require due to two different types of perfecting. Cognition seeks a different goal than uh, the will. Cognition seeks truth, whereas the intellectual appetite, the will, seeks goodness for the overall person. So intellectual virtue is a mental skill perfecting cognitive power. These are habits of thinking well, right? We say that someone is smart because they have uh, these intellectual virtues. The will seeks moral goodness of the overall person. That's different than truth. Goodness is different than truth. A moral virtue, this is what we normally think of when we use the word virtue, that it's moral. Uh, but intellectual virtues are ethically neutral. You can have a smart person who is evil. You can have a smart person who is good. But in terms of the will, these are habits of choosing goodness. A moral virtue is a habit that makes its possessor morally good. It's a habit of the will to choose rightly. A moral habit of the will uh, orders the passions by reason to express human excellence. Passions is emotions, right? Emotions are important, are essential. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a moment. But the will orders them, right? So that we feel the right things at the right times. We choose the right things at the right times. It, this is the intellect leading emotion. But emotion is still essential, rather than emotion leading the intellect. So there's two forms of thinking. Let's talk specifically about intellectual virtue. There's speculative reason, which is called the first act of the mind. This is the reason that, think, that seeks theoretical truth. Sorry, no, this is uh, not the first act of the mind. Uh, this is just one of the two forms of thinking, because we also have practical reason we'll get to in a moment. So the first act of the mind is simple apprehension, which is understanding of simple concepts. This is knowing the definitions of a term, like unicorn, right? I understand what a unicorn is, uh, but it takes the second act of the mind to say the unicorn does exist, right? This is a proposition. This is just not the definition of one word. This is a sentence. Something exists. Right? And the judgment uh, is perfected through wisdom, which is knowing causes. Right? Knowing, let's say, like the four causes. Understanding is the virtue that perfects the first act of the mind. Wisdom perfects the second act of the mind. And the third act of the mind is reason. Right? Reason is deduction, is argument. So in the first act of the mind, we have definitions of words. And then we take those words and we combine them into sentences that are true or false propositions, right, in an act of judgment. And then we can take several propositions and combine them into an argument, like deduction is an example, right? And the perfection of that ability is called science uh, as an intellectual virtue. So here are three intellectual virtues for Aquinas. That's just for the first form of thinking, which is speculative reason, uh, which seeks truth in the abstract. And then we have practical reason. Practical reason seeks uh, the truth of action, right? That which is truly good. So it still seeks truth, but it seeks truth for the sake of action. And we have uh, two different virtues. We have art or craftsmanship, the ability to create. Then we have prudence, which is practical wisdom. 
All right, these are intellectual virtues. Aquinas asks whether they can be moral virtue without passion. He says, no man uh, is just who rejoices not in his deeds. Um, that is Aquinas quoting Aristotle. So you must not only do good, you must love doing it. Virtues express reason leading the affections. That makes emotion essential. Uh, is all this self-fulfillment and human flourishing talk selfish and self-centered? That's an important question, a challenge that is often posed to this kind of virtue ethic. All right, I want to introduce you to these two terms. Disinterested is when you act without your own interest. You don't act for your own agenda. You don't have some secret agenda, ulterior motive. You act for the sake of someone else, let's say. For example, I give money to the homeless with no secret agenda. I don't use people. Right. Versus interested ethics. Different ethical theories land in one of these two camps. Right. So disinterest, um, utilitarianism of John Stuart Mill, deontology of Immanuel Kant. These are disinterested. Uh, the virtue ethics of Aquinas or of Aristotle are interested ethics, which is to say that you act for your own interest in some sense. All right, an important way to show the merits of this is to distinguish between selfish and selfless. Selfishness seeks my desire at another person's expense. Selflessness is seeking my desire through seeking another's desire. For example, if I bring my wife flowers because making her happy makes me happy, uh, that's good, right? That's selfless. If it didn't make me happy, something's wrong, right? So my goal, my desire, is to make her happy. So then when she becomes happy, fulfilling her desire, right? her happiness was my goal, and because it was my goal, my desire has been fulfilled. So my desire is fulfilled through seeking her desire. That is selfless, which is different than selfish. Right? So interested ethics says that every ethical action that we do, this is important, okay, this is important. Uh, Interested ethics says that every action that we do, every choice that we make, not only is it for the sake of another person's good, but that serving another person is my goal, and therefore when I do serve them, I am at the same time fulfilling my own desire, because I desire to see the other person uh, have something good. Right. So every ethical action is fulfilling a good desire in myself. That's not the same as selfishness. Justice is a special case in Aquinas. It's the only virtue that can be given uh, with no emotion, this is supposed to say. Uh, justice is a special case because it's the only virtue that can be given with no emotion, though joy results from it. That's because justice in its nature is uh, not an emotional kind of thing. It's supposed to be impartial and fair, right? That being said, once justice happens, we should feel joy that justice happens. Aquinas asks whether there are four cardinal virtues. Okay, so we talked about the different types of intellectual virtue. Now let's talk about the different types of moral virtue. These divide into cardinal virtues and moral or Sorry. We have intellectual virtues, and then we have moral virtues. And of the moral virtues, we have two categories. We have cardinal virtues, and we have theological virtues. Let's talk about the cardinal virtues first. Cardinal virtue. Cardinal means most important. So these are the most important virtues. There are also lesser virtues. Human nature inherently has the capacity from birth to acquire cardinal virtues in part on human power alone. Prudence is one of them, which is practical reason. This is interesting because it is shared, uh, it is an intellectual virtue and a moral virtue. Practical wisdom, this is wisdom, uh, this causes the reason to seek truth about what is good. Right? It organizes um, other virtues. The only, this is the only dual intellectual and moral virtue. Justice, which is fairness, causes the good of right operation, right? That I do the right kinds of things in the right ways. 
Temperance, which is self-control and moderation, guarding against the passions or emotions, controlling the mind and being in excess. And then fortitude, courage, strengthen, strengthens the mind to overcome the passions, uh, namely fear. Right? There are many other moral virtues of the will, but every moral virtue contains some aspect of all four of these. That's why these are cardinal, because these are not only virtues, these are aspects of every virtuous action. Right? Every virtuous action is going to be guided by wisdom, fairness, self-control, and the overcoming of obstacles in fortitude. Prudence is, is special in that it unites and orders all the intellectual and moral virtues to one goal, the overall goal of the human person. Aquinas asks whether the theological virtues are distinct from the intellectual and moral virtues. He says the theological virtues are above man's nature, while the intellectual and moral virtues are in proportion to his nature. All right, this is to say, human nature desires infinite good. We've mentioned this a little bit before. Since humans are finite, the fulfillment of that desire, namely happiness or eudaimonia, or human flourishing, is beyond the capacity or power of humans to obtain on their own effort. The human end, or telos, is thus generically happiness, and specifically the beatific vision. Therefore, although, human, although people can obtain happiness in part by their own effort through their natural capacity for cardinal virtues, they cannot, on their own effort, obtain perfect happiness in perfecting the cardinal virtues or in obtaining theological virtues. Right? Theological virtues are beyond our ability. And because we need these uh, theological virtues in order to have happiness, and we need the perfection of the cardinal virtues in order to have happiness, they are beyond our ability. All right, so theological virtues are moral virtues that are given or infused by God because human nature cannot obtain them even in part on its own power. They are all oriented to God as their object. So he asks about which ones they are, right? Faith, hope, and charity. Are they the theological virtues? So what are these? Faith is the virtue whereby we assent to the truth of supernaturally revealed principles, articles of faith, as contained in the Bible, which is the special self-revelation of God. So faith is just... Uh, faith is a virtue by which we um, believe the right things uh, about God. He says, in An act of the intellect assenting to the divine truth at the command of the will moved by the grace of God. Right. So it's given by grace. All th three of these theological virtues are given by God, by God in his grace. Then we have hope. Hope is a virtue whereby we trust that God we trust God in obtaining final happiness. So hope is oriented towards obtaining something, namely happiness. Rather than just assenting to truth, it is um, a trust that we will obtain final happiness. He says hope makes us tend, which means to trust, uh, trust to God as to a good to be obtained, finally, and as to a helper strong to assist. So hope is trusting that we will obtain the beatific vision, we will obtain God, and trusting that God will be our helper in helping us attain this. And then charity. Uh, this is similar to love. This is the virtue whereby we unconditionally serve another's good, right? Love of God and people, not ice cream or pets. Uh, that's why he doesn't just call this the virtue of love. He calls it charity because charity is love of people, not just love of ice cream. Charity is the mother and the root of all the virtues, right? Because it's seeking another person good. It most fully expresses the nature of virtue. The virtue whereby we this is the virtue whereby we love God for his own sake and, and it unifies all other appetites and directs them at God. Love of neighbor is included in the love of God, for one's neighbor is uh, for loving one's neighbor is the love of the image of God in a uh, biblical sort of theology, which is human nature. So, so human nature is an image of God, a reflection of God's nature. So when we love some person, we are loving them in virtue of their reflection of God's character. So therefore, um, even in loving people, it is loving God. So love for 
Aquinas is always directed at God and is therefore a theological virtue and therefore only comes uh, truly, truly love only comes from God if he gives us that virtue. And therefore, one cannot love God without also loving one's neighbor. All of the moral virtues remain incomplete if they fail to direct us to God, according to Aquinas. Now he asks whether virtue is in us by nature. He says, yes, we are born with the capacity to attain the intellectual virtues and cardinal virtues in part because this is part of our human nature. But also he says, no, in another sense, we cannot attain the intellectual or cardinal virtues in full, nor we can obtain nor can we obtain the theological virtues even in part without the grace of God infusing us with goodness. He asks whether any virtue is caused in us by habitation. So he talks about habit, right? Yes, practice makes perfect. We mentioned this already. Um, each choice we make is moral, and we should choose so that wisdom leads emotions, for foolishness is when the emotions lead reason. Each choice makes the next easier. Eventually, repetition forms habit. Right? Habit is a disposition to act in a certain way in similar circumstances. For example, uh, a disposition, right? in terms of some aspects of our personality. We might talk about a football player and physical habits. Um, so a football player, at first, when he's a kid, just learning how to throw a ball, you know, it's hard. He has to think about it. But eventually he practices so much that he, uh, he reacts without even thinking about it because he has habit. In this situation, he can just react. We also have emotional habits, like when a song reminds you of previous emotions or when you're naturally sympathetic towards starving people. These are emotional habits. Habits are like a second nature. So by nature, we do not already know how to play football well. All right? Um, but through practice, we can become very good at it. Practice makes perfect. And so therefore, for the football player, he has physical habits that are like a second nature. It is not natural but it has become as if it was natural because now uh, he makes it look easy because of his practice. By nature, we have the capacity for virtue, but we do not naturally have full virtue. When a habit develops, it becomes natural for us to act in this new way. For example, uh, it's second nature for the football player to react properly without having to think about it. Once we have a habit, we don't have to think about it. The habit was created through reason. Every action is moral if it is ordered by reason, but that doesn't mean we, deliber we deliberate or think about every choice. In fact, it's best if we develop habits to the point where acting rationally is second nature, the virtuous life of human flourishing. So it's good if we get to the point where we don't, we don't even have to think all the time in order to do the right thing. We just automatically do the right thing without even thinking about it. Right? That's really good. That's very virtuous. We don't even have to think about it. We just automatically react in the right way. Aquinas asks whether moral virtues observe the mean. This is Aristotle's golden mean. Whether vice is contrary to virtue and whether vice is contrary to nature. Let's tackle all these at the same time. Virtue is a fulfillment of human nature. We've discussed this. Virtue, vice is contrary to human nature. Right? Vice is the opposite. Three things are contrary to human nature. Sin, which is an, an inordinate act. Malice, which is the intent to do evil. And vice, which is a habit or disposition to act in a way contrary to human nature. Let's talk more about this vice. Vice acts against human nature. For example, it fulfills uh, the function of a car to maintain it properly and drive according to law. If someone puts the wrong fuel in, drives with a brake on, mistreats it, and doesn't follow the laws, it will break uh, the car because these actions work against its nature, right? These actions are bad actions. They are inordinate actions. But a pattern, a habit of these inordinate actions is called a vice. So one type of vice is a deficiency. For example, cowardice. These are character traits, right? These are habits, bad habits. Habits that make their possessor bad. Deficiency, cowardice, apathy, laziness, stinginess, false modesty, indecisiveness, right? These are vices. 
of deficiency. We also have vices of excess correlating to the deficiencies, right? So instead of cowardice, we have recklessness. Instead of apathy, we have obsession. Instead of laziness, we have greed. Instead of stinginess, we have extravagance. False modesty is to pride as indecisiveness is to impulsiveness, right? So we have this spectrum here. Deficiency to excess. And in the middle, we have the golden mean, which is virtue in moderation, right? So between cowardice and recklessness, we have courage. Between apathy and obsession, uh, we have compassion. Between laziness and greed, we have patience. Between stinginess and extravagance, generosity. Between false modesty and pride, we have humility. Between indecisiveness and impulsiveness, we have self-control. This is uh, the golden mean as adopted from Aristotle. Aquinas asks whether every sin includes an action. No, some sins are sins of omission, as you might say, as when one fails to fulfill a duty. Since voluntariness is essential to sin, even a sin of omission is still a sin act of commission. Thus, failing to act when one should is a sin, whether in a self-conscious way or out of neglect. Except in the case where one is not uh, when it is not in one's power to do something. So if somebody does not do something, it's not a sin, it's not bad, if they didn't even have the ability to do the thing. There is no sin of omission unless we omit what we can do or not do. Now, I hope, I hope you've liked this uh, and have benefited from this lecture on Aquinas on happiness and virtue. Again, I encourage you to um, to watch my lectures on Aristotle to get some more background on it and see the ways that they agree and the ways that Aquinas kind of develops Aristotle's thought. Let's do the write-up. How do you define happiness? Are there at least some common principles that apply universally to all people? Or is happiness entirely up to individual choice, right? Uh, of course, you want to distinguish between things considered in themselves and all things considered. So uh, maybe there are some principles that are common to all of us, or maybe not at all, right? Even if the common principles are applied in different ways. Two, can we attain perfect happiness in this life? What do you think about that theory that Aquinas has? Right? Let's assess his theories about happiness. Can we attain perfect virtue in this life? What do you think? And why? List three virtues not mentioned in this video and their corresponding deficiency and excess to kind of practice the golden mean. Right? This will help us identify virtuous, virtuous character traits in other people. What do you think is the relationship between reason and emotion in a morally good choice, right? Which one leads the other, or how do they relate to each other? How do they interact in your mind? How should they interact in your mind when you're making a good choice? Do you think embryonic stem cell research is permissible? Use the seven categories of circumstance to answer, right? That's a very interesting case, um, depending on how you think about the circumstantial variables. Go back and look at the circumstantial variables and apply them to that debate.